The gods are not completely immortal. There are creatures and monstrous things within the various mythological cosmoses that would make a god tremble. These supposedly immortal beings with their unimaginable power ruling over cosmic domains are aware of these creatures and knowing they are around would instill genuine fear in them. In this video, I will uncover the myths and narratives surrounding these terrifying creatures and explain their origins, conflicts, and most importantly, I'll unravel their power, allowing us to understand the reasons why the gods are afraid of them. I'll examine some of the ancient texts and mythologies and explain why these creatures were not just feared, but also respected due to their ability to alter the balance of power in the universe. However, before I do this, no journey should begin without a pleasant beverage. And so, grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Craig and Ford. Greek mythology contains a fascinating mix of monsters, and some of the most underrated are the Furies, or Erenes, and we find them described in two key Greek texts, Hesiod's Theogony and Aeschylus' Eumenides, which is the third play in the Orestia trilogy. To understand where they come from, we must go back to the beginning of Greek creation, and what's a number of versions of the Greek creation myth? The one that helps us here is Hesiod's Theogony, where we see Uranus as the first offspring of the primordial beings, castrated by his own son, Kronos. And I discuss this creation myth and its origin in this video. However, what we find out is that the blood from the castration of Uranus gives rise to the Furies, as it says of Gaia within the Theogony that, for Earth received all the bloody drops that shot forth, and when the years had revolved, she bore the mighty Erenes and the great giants shining in their armour, holding long spears in their hands, and the nymphs, whom they call the men and ones on the boundless earth. But we know Greek mythology is multi-layered and complex, and so we see the Furies, also said to be the children of Hades and Persephone, Nyx or Poiene. These women were described as hag-like, ugly, winged women with hair, arms and waist entwined with poisonous serpents. They wielded whips and were clothed either in long black robes of mourners or the short length skirts and boots of huntresses. So why did the gods fear these creatures? Well, the reason was due to their role as avengers of moral and divine laws. The Furies were known to relentlessly pursue perpetrators of heinous crimes such as violations of filial duties and the natural order including murder, perjury and disrespect of the gods. And this relentless pursuit of justice occurred even when against divine figures. And we do have examples of this in mythology where Aeschylus writes, the Furies hunted Orestes for the murder of his mother Clytemnestra who herself had killed his father, Agamemnon. Orestes' trial, arbitrated by the goddess Athena, highlights the paradox of his crime and the dread that Furies impose. It is the fear of divine retribution by the Furies that forces Orestes to seek Athena's wisdom. Thus, while the Furies represent figures of terror, this was only for those who violated moral and divine laws, and those who did this including the gods, would find inescapable consequences from the Furies. Therefore, they can be said to represent a primal form of justice, one that the gods respect, and so have created a balance between fear and reverence for themselves. We see this dual aspect in the Eumenides, where the Furies transform into the Eumenides, or the kindly ones, becoming protectors of Athens when respected and properly appeased. However, for us, these furies represent a figure that gods would want to avoid, even if they may not appear terrifying to all. And do you know what else wasn't terrifying to all? Well, yes, that's right. 
is the like and subscribe buttons which you can defeat just by clicking on them. And now they are defeated, I hope, we can look at a figure who was terrifying. Kali is often referred to as a goddess in Hindu mythology, in books such as the Tantras and the Devi Mahatmya, and is a figure of considerable complexity and depth. She, like the Furies, has an aspect of duality about her, as while she is often depicted as a fierce and terrifying woman, leading her to sometimes be viewed as monstrous, she is also revered as a mother goddess and a liberator. She is often depicted with dark blue or black skin, a garland of skulls, and a skirt of severed arms, signifying her connection with death and time. Kelly's protruding tongue, typically interpreted as a sign of her all-consuming and transformative power, contributes to her fearsome image. For us, it is Kelly's most famous mythological narrative from the Devi Mahatmya, in which we see her power. In this story, male gods are unable to defeat the demon Raktabaja, whose power was such that a clone would sprout from each drop of his blood that fell to the ground. The gods turned to the goddess Durga for help, who in turn birthed Kali from her brow. And thus it was Kali who defeated Raktabaja by consuming the clones and drinking his blood before it could fall on the ground. To quote a passage from this text, Kali sprang forth, frightful of countenance and armed with sword and noose, bearing a strange skull-topped staff, adorned with a garland of skulls and clad in a tiger skin, her emaciated flesh appalling, her mouth gaping, her lolling tongue horrifying, her sunken eyes glowing red, she filled the four quarters of the sky with her roars, swiftly falling upon the great Asuras in that army. She slew and devoured those hosts of the gods' foes. This narrative showcases Kali's immense power, and this is why the gods would fear her, because it becomes very clear whilst reading this story that it's not about Raktabija being feared, but the terrifying power that Kali can manifest to defeat him. So what else can we say about her? Well, her name derives from the Sanskrit word Kala, which means time. And this is because she symbolises the destructive aspect of time, as time, given enough of it, devours all things. Now, whilst this power of time is not necessarily viewed as evil, it is a necessary part of the cosmic cycle of creation and preservation and destruction. And the gods of Hinduism, despite their divinity, are not immune to the passage of time, and so they fear the destruction it brings and therefore fear Kali, who personifies this. I think it would be fair to say that Kali's power is uncontrollable, and her association with time means that her power is inevitable and unstoppable, and this, coupled with her form itself terror-inducing, signifies her role as a cosmic power. However, she is also revered as a divine mother and liberator, showing complexity within her character, allowing people to be in fear of her, but also to have reverence for her and love her in worship. And so to continue this theme of monsters who are also mothers, let's talk about Tiamat. Within Mesopotamian mythology, we have the creation myths of Babylon and Sumer, and these start by talking about there being two primordial beings at the start of time in a watery cosmos and their names are Apsu and Tiamat, and who are associated with freshwater and saltwater respectively. These two beings are most often imagined as serpents, but in reality are almost certainly analogues for the Euphrates River and the Persian Gulf, into which the Euphrates flows, and the myth goes that when these two beings came together, intertwined, they created a generation of gods and demons. And to affirm this, some of these gods' names refer to areas of water where the Euphrates meet the Persian Gulf. And if you want to know more about this myth, then I'll talk about it in this video. The creation myth of this region, and in fact, many of the creation myths with an agricultural farming influence whose source can be traced back to this region, have many conflicts within their beginnings, 
especially with regards to the first few generations of gods, which is seen here when Apsu is removed from the story relatively quickly. However, Tiamat holds a central place in the creation myth, and her influence is so great that she would later be written into the opening verses of Genesis in the Bible. Now, like Kali, who we spoke about before, while she is considered a powerful monster, her actions are influenced by motherhood, making her a more nuanced character than many would realise. The issues in this cosmos start when the first generation of offspring from Tiamat and Apsu become noisy and disruptive, and this angered Apsu and led him wanting to destroy them. But in an act of paternal compassion, Tiamat protects them, and when the young gods find out about Apsu's plan, they're led by Ea to kill Apsu. However, this causes Tiamat to grieve, and this grief turns to rage, and so Apsu's death needs to be avenged. And Tiamat creates an army with the aid of her new consort, Kingu, who becomes their leader, and she then transforms herself into a massive, multi-headed dragon, and it was this transformation, coupled with her immense power as a primordial deity, that instilled fear in the gods, so much so that only one of the gods wanted to fight her, and the rest hid away. And that god was Marduk. Timat is a symbol of the primeval chaos that predates Alda, and so we can interpret the fighting of Tiamat as a way of preventing regression back into primordial chaos. And that is a very important fight to win, as losing it would mean the death of many, many gods. Ultimately, she is defeated by Marduk, who uses wind to keep her mouth open, allowing him to shoot an arrow into her heart. He then removes her head from her dead body, and with the carcass, he carves it in two so as to create the earth and the firmament to protect it from the primordial waters of the cosmos. A motif which continues in other creation myths we find in the Indo European landscape. But I should also give a shout out to the Hindu mythologist Vitra at this point, as I've shown in this video, when comparing the myth of Indra and Vitra that it is an analogue with Marduk and Tiamat. But from the point of view of this video, whilst Fitra is a monstrous being, his body was not used to create the world when he was defeated, and so he lacks the size and, in some ways, the physical manifestation of Tiamat, which is why she is placed here as a preference. Norse mythology is full of interesting beasts and characters, and one of the most monstrous is the wolf, which we now know as Fenrir. While he is referenced in the Prose Edda, it is the poetic Edda where information about him is considered most reliable. He is mentioned a few times, but the most important occurrence to us is in the Volospor, which talks about the creation of the cosmos and the end of the world. Fenrir is the child of Loki, and the giantess Angrabutha, and according to Old Norse literature, it is Fenrir's size and strength which were foreboding, and his jaws, when opened, reached between the earth and the sky, and this would cause great concern among the gods, and this fear is best understood in the story about Fenrir's binding, found in the Gilfaganin section of the Prose Edda. Here, it tells of the well, how the gods were alarmed by Fenrir's rapid growth, and that the prophecy that Fenrir would cause immense destruction. And so they decided to bind the wolf using various fetters. Each attempt failed, so the gods commissioned the dwarves to forge Glipnir, a magical ribbon-like fetter made from six impossible ingredients, including the sound of a cat's footfall and the beard of a woman. In effect, really impossible things, so it could not be recreated by mortals. However, Fenrir, not wishing to be bound indefinitely, asked for the hand of one of the gods to be placed in his mouth, such that if he could not escape the bindings, he would take the hand of that god. And it was Tyr who placed his hand in Fenrir's mouth, and with Glipnir holding Fenrir in place, it was Tyr who lost his hand 
as Fendry a bit down like in protest at being bound in unbreakable bonds. However, there was the prophecy of Ragnarok which said that Fenrir would break free of his bonds and when this happened this would be one of the signals that Ragnarok had started and so the cataclysmic destruction of the cosmos would begin. The prophecy went on to say that the wolf would consume Odin, the chief god amongst the Nordic pantheon, which would turn the tide of that final battle and as such would mark the end of the cosmos. It is argued that there is symbolism within the story suggesting that chaos and destruction must be contained within the cosmos because not doing so would result in the end of the cosmos, which is what eventually happens alongside the death of Odin. And it was Fenrir's killing of Odin alongside the destruction he then waged that made the wolf one of the most feared creatures in mythology. Now before I move on, I also want to let you know that whilst we call this wolf Fenrir, that is not actually the name of the wolf. Instead, Fenrir is another name for Loki, the trickster god, and so the wolf was originally known as Fenrir's wolf, and through poetic simplification, Fenrir's wolf, or Loki's wolf, became shortened to Fenrir. And this isn't unique to Fenrir, we see this happening in other parts of Nordic mythology with the name of Yggdrasil, for example, and we see such simplification even happening this day, with most people thinking uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was the name of the monster, but the monster was called Frankenstein's monster, and his name, well, he was never really given a name by his creator anyway, but he did ask to be called Adam, but many people think the monster's name is Frankenstein when it isn't. The Jormungandr, sometimes called the Mythgartha Serpent, was another beast fathered by Loki and the giantess Angrabotha, and this monster represents the ultimate dragon of Nordic mythology. We know this because we can position this monster when we see Thor, the heroic god, trying to catch it and kill it within the poem Hymiskiva, and this poem is a reflex of the much older mythology about cattle raiding from the Indo-European cultures. And if you want to know more about this, then watch this video next. However, the premise is that the dragon must be killed to rescue the cattle. And this is an adaptation of all the other dragon myths you may have heard before, such as that of Marduk and Tiamat, Indra and Vitra, or even George and the dragon. However, the placement of Numenganda on Mythgard, the world of mankind, is crucial to the structure of the Norse cosmos. This serpent's size is so immense that it grasps its tail in its mouth, forming an urubus, encircling the entire world, making the serpent, if it was real, 40,000 kilometers long or almost 25,000 miles from head to tail. This allows a monster to have a symbolic significance as a boundary keeper of the mortal realm, a position that highlights the power this serpent had. However, not much else is known about the serpent's features apart from it being poisonous and so to consider it snake-like would probably be most appropriate. However, we are not here to discuss humans' fears of monsters, but the god's fear. And the key reason for the god's fear of the human gander is held within the prophecy of Ragnarok, which is the time when the cosmos collapses and the current cycle of time ends. The prophecy says that when the Jormungandr releases its tail, it triggers the onset of Ragnarok, and this event is apocalyptic to the extent that many of the gods, including Odin and Thor and Loki, would meet their end. And this is because gods in Nordic mythology are mortal, their magic helps protect them. Within the Prose Edda, which is the 13th century text written by Snorri Sturluson, it was written that during Ragnarok, the human Gander and Thor will engage in a deadly battle, and Thor would strike it with a mortal blow. However, he would succumb to the serpent's venom at death, dying after taking nine steps. And Thor was considered the god that most warriors would sacrifice to. He was the hero of Nordic myth, 
And so it is this power and prophecy which the Jumungandr shows that instills the fear of this creature amongst the Nordic gods. And if we look at this symbolically, then the figure of the Jumungandr represents the forces of chaos and destruction held at bay to keep the cosmos calm. But it is inevitable that they will eventually be unleashed, which makes Jumungandr a constant reminder of the precarious balance of the cosmos and the inevitable demise of the gods. And so this representation of chaos and destruction, balanced with the inevitability of Ragnarok, made the Nordic gods fear this creature. But there is one creature, one monstrous being I consider more powerful than the Rumangander, and that is Typhon. Near the beginning of time in Greek mythology, a creature portrayed as the fearsome serpent and regarded as the deadliest of creatures was Typhon. Greek mythology is complicated because of how stories change and develop over time, but Typhon is typically considered the offspring of Gaia, the Earth, and Tartarus, the personification of a pit that lies beneath the Earth. The result was this gigantic, fire-breathing monster with 100 dragon heads and the legs of a human. And just in this form, it would have been a formidable opponent to the gods. But let me actually read you an abridged description of this from Hesiod's Theogony, so you can hear this from the ancient Greek sources. And we'll start the story with Zeus about to fight Typhon, or Typhus as he is known in Greek. When Zeus had driven the Titans from heaven, huge earth bore her youngest child, Typhus, with the love of Tartarus. Strength was with his hands in all that he did, and the feet of this strong god was untiring. From his shoulders grew a hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon with dark, flickering tongues, and from under the brows of his eyes, in his marvellous heads flashed fire, and fire burned from his heads as he glared. And there were voices in all of his dreadful heads, which uttered every kind of unspeakable sound, for at one time they made sounds such that the gods understood, but at another they made the noise of a ball bellowing a loud in proud, ungovernable fury, and then at another the sound of a lion, relentless of heart, and at another sounds like whelps, wonderful to hear, and again at another he would hiss so that the high mountains echoed back this noise. Typhus would have come to reign over mortals and immortals had not the father of men and gods been quick to perceive what he wanted to do. Mount Olympus reeled beneath the divine feet of Zeus as he rose and earth groaned thereat, and through the two of them heat took hold on the dark blue sea, through the thunder and lightning and through the fire from the monster and the scorching winds and blazing thunderbolt. The whole earth seethed, and the sky and sea, and the long waves raged along the beaches round and about at the rush of the deathless gods, and there arose an endless shaking. Hades trembled where he rules over the dead below, and the titans trembled under Tartarus because of the unending clamour and the fearful strife. Zeus raised up his might and seized Typhus's arms, thunder and lightning and lurid thunderbolt, he leapt from Olympus and struck him, and burned all the marvellous heads of the monster about him. But when Zeus had conquered him and lashed him with strokes, Typhus was hurled down, a maimed wreck, so that the huge earth groaned, and flame shot forth from the thunder-stricken lord in the dim rugged glens of the mount when he was smitten. This story is known as the Typhonomachy or the Battle with Typhon and we are aware of this mythology as it is primarily comes from the ancient literary sources, specifically Hesiod's Theogony and Apollodorus's Bibliotheca, although the latter account is less detailed. According to West's translation and commentary on Hesiod's Theogony, Typhon was a personification of destructive volcanic forces. His stature was such that his head touched the stars 
while his arms extended east and west, which made him a threat to the cosmic order of things, and thus well, a natural enemy of the gods who were responsible for maintaining the cosmic order. And so this battle could be interpreted as a fight between order, so Zeus, and chaos, Typhon. And now, there are some academics who perceive a collapse of the divine order, and this is more of an interpretation than a concrete event described in the sources, and it's based on the fact that the divine order in Greek mythology was held together by Zeus's rule, and so his initial defeat and incapacitation at the hands of Typhon would symbolise a disruption in this order, and this would result in fear and potential chaos, and had other gods going into hiding, which is interpreted as the gods going to Egypt. And as a side note, this is much like the gods hiding away from Tiamat and Vutra in other mythologies with dragon motifs. But with this collapse of order, which is followed by Zeus's subsequent victory over Typhon, we see an interpretation of the act of restoration and reinforcement of this divine order. With all things considered, Typhon, his size, how he is built and what he represents is a multifaceted construct that combines the fear of his physical strength, his representation of destructive natural forces and the symbol of chaos and disorder he embodied, represents to me a being that was, well, feared amongst gods and people. Placing Typhon within mythological narratives also allows for an allegory that could be considered to reflect the ancient Greeks' perception of natural disasters and their effect on human societies, alongside the continuous struggle for order and stability against disruptive forces, a theme that resonates in many world mythologies. I love mythology. Many different cultures brim with tales of gods, heroes and monstrous beings. These monstrous entities can inspire fear even in the most divine figures. But they are also far from mere figments of ancient imagination. They serve a higher purpose, symbolising various aspects of human experience, such as natural phenomena and moral principles. And we see this from the fearsome Typhon in Greek mythology, the monstrous sea serpent Eurymangander, and the mighty wolf Fenrir in Norse myths, all the way to the goddess Kali in Hinduism, and the primordial entity Tiamat in Mesopotamian lore. Each of these beings encapsulates a powerful principle or force that threatens the established divine order. Typhon, for instance, is depicted as a cataclysmic force, a chaotic entity that, upon its uprising, compels the Greek gods to flee, thus illustrating the divine fear of chaos and upheaval. Similarly, Jormungandr and Fenrir in Norse mythology embody the prophesied destruction of the universe, signifying the inevitability of endings and rebirth. Kali, despite her terrifying image, is the destructive force necessary for the renewal of life. Her rampage is calmed only by the intervention of Shiva, reflecting the balance of destructive and restorative forces. Tiamat, the primordial saltwater goddess, becomes a symbol of chaos and monstrous birth, embodying the threat of the cosmos, reverting to its original state of disorder. However, these monstrous beings were not just about fear, because there was respect for them too. The gods, although powerful and immortal, were wary of these entities, and this fear underscores the recognition of a balance between order and chaos, creation and destruction, justice and retribution, which balances that even gods cannot disrupt without consequences. Now the order I gave these beings in is of course subjective, but what is important about all of them is that their existence is pivotal to the richness and depth of the mythologies they inhabit, reflecting the shared human endeavour to understand and navigate the complexities of existence. And so... Whether it's Typhon challenging Zeus, his authority, or Kali battling demons, or the Furies seeking retribution, each narrative is a reflection of human fear and hope, our struggles and our triumphs. And so, 
I want to thank you all for watching and if you think there are larger, scarier things inside the Indo-European landscape, I'll be interested in knowing them. I also want to thank my patrons for their support, questions and feedback. And if you want to know more about monsters, then this is my video about the origin of dragons, which is well worth a watch. Please stay safe and well. This was Crack and Ford.